please go online and give us your feedback. Um, let us know what talks you liked, what talks you didn't like, um, what ideas we could have, uh, have presented but, but didn't, what, if we miss anything. Please, your feedback is vitally important. And because of how small and kind of exclusive um, ShmooCon is, um, your feedback actually makes a real difference. It, it, get, it gets heard. I'm sure we'll have loads of technical problems. No, not with these guys. They tend to make it run really oh. easily. No, 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 on our oh. side. Oh. We're not very good at computers. Oh. <laughs> let me, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me turn that off. It's kind of like math. So we have about one more minute okay. to let people filter in. Okay, so just, just, the just command tab. Yep. Yep. Great. All right. Um, I have been told to tell you, or at least I've been informed, that Brian's official title is life form, but Mike's not sure whether he qualifies for that yet. It's, um, uh, we have had a lot of talks. This uh, th sort of a theme of this conference has been on throwing real science at security, um, which I'm actually really excited to see. And this talk is another one in that line, the practical applications of data science in detection. Gentlemen. Thanks. Sure. So luckily for you guys, I'm gonna, or we're gonna spare you a lot of PowerPoint. I think we've got five or six slides. Unluckily for you guys, we're going to use IPython notebooks. You'll get to see some code and graphs as, as we run through the presentation. So thank you for attending Practical Applications of Data Science and Detection. I'm Mike Sconzo. That's Brian Wiley. Uh, this is probably a pretty good buzzword bingo talk, but hopefully you guys will learn things. So one of the main things I really want to emphasize, and I'll post a link in a second, try this at home. It's a lot of fun. We're actually going to release, and we did this morning on our GitHub, both IPython notebooks and some of the data that we use to actually perform the calculations so everybody can go home and, and play to their heart's content. And by all means, if you have any questions, feel free to always reach out. So brief introduction. When we talk about data, data science, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about people who really like to tinker, people who understand right, math and, math and statistics, and people who understand things about a subject. Are they all one person? Maybe. In this case, it's two people. Uh, Brian has a crazy wealth of statistics and math knowledge. I have enough to be dangerous. I might be the subject matter expert, for lack of a better word, and we both really love to tinker with things. So this is a, a really good combination for both of us. Hopefully it pays off for everybody. So once again, just a slight brief plug. We're at Click Security. Luckily enough, they paid for us to come here. So thanks, guys. All right. So there are kind of two main things when you're running through, through data science. One is you have to have data to analyze. So great, how did we do this? Well, for our use cases today that we're going to be talking about, we used Bro, and we used SQL Map and JBROFuzz to generate all the data that we're going to look at. Then to actually analyze the data, we use primarily IPython Notebook because it has a really nice flow that you can begin to structure things through. And then we obviously use the Python pandas library as well as a couple other ones. So these tools are fantastic. And if you want to take a picture of the slide, the notebooks will actually be at the very last link. And I don't know if you guys can, can read that well or not. But it's clicksecurity.github.io slash data underscore hacking. If you just go to GitHub and you type in data hacking, it'll be one of the first links. Even better. All right. OK. So we're going to take a look at two use cases today, primarily because we thought they were pretty interesting to us, and second, they might be interesting to everybody else. So the first one we're going to look at is SQL detection, right? So given a random string, 
how can I determine that it has tokens or patterns in it that might indicate that someone's trying to, to slip one past the goalie. So our main goal when setting out to do this was to do this without regular expressions. Second is browser fingerprinting. Both Poff and Bro have capabilities to say, hey, wait a second, I think this, this browser connection is lying to me. That's awesome, they've got some good signatures. However, there's always room for more signatures. So we're gonna look at some ways that you can generate your own as well as run this type of analysis in your own environment. All uh, right, so, oh, this is just a, a brief, this is what the data hacking page looks like on GitHub. Um, so we've got everything up there. And now, oh, all right, sweet. So now onto SQL injection. Everybody in here familiar with SQL injection? Anybody not understand? Oh, okay, fine. So brief introduction to SQL injection. Someone tries to escape or um, an SQL command via a web app or some other kind of application to cause the original query to be changed to maybe dump information or execute commands locally. The idea is with everything else is to cause the system to do something it wasn't designed or intended to do. So for this again, we use SQL map and JRuefuzz to actually generate a whole bunch of strings that are known for SQL injection, right? These are known tools that people run to say, hey, is my app vulnerable to SQL injection? And then we use the SQL Python or SQL parse Python library to go ahead and pull this information back out to do analysis. Is that mostly readable for you guys? Okay, cool. So this is We'll skip all this. This is just setting up code in IPython so we can get pretty graphs later on. So, okay, one of the most important things, obviously, when doing data analysis is to get data. The second most important thing is to understand it and to be able to kind of get it into a form that is useful for the analysis. So that's all this really does right here. It just structures it up and it gives on the bottom, I'll scroll up to the top, kind of a final count. So we have, in this case, pre-tag data, right, we have almost 13,000 rows that came from these different SQL injection to tools, uh, and then we spent some time scouring GitHub and Google and looking for examples of legitimate SQL queries so we would have a legitimate set to test against as well. And, and the other thing to note here is just, you know, in that few lines of Python, we went from a, from a raw, you know, either bro a log or a CSV file, um, and we loaded it into uh, a pandas data frame. And, and a pandas data frame is kind of the Python equivalent of an R data frame or a MATLAB data frame. It's basically a dictionary of series um, uh, so that each, each column on some sense is named, and then, and then it's often stored as a NumPy array underneath. Um, but you know, all of that really means that you're one really good step towards analysis. So once you get it into a pandas data frame, um, you kind of open up the world to a, to a large set of Python modules, you know, statistics modules, uh, you know, scikit-learn, um, numpy, scipy. Um, once you've transferred your data into a Python data frame, uh, it really kind of opens up the door for all of these different uh, packages. And so, you know, Pandas is just a great uh, uh, toolkit, and I, and I highly recommend it. Um, it it kind of changes the way you think about data and how you organize it. That's a good point. So just kind of a peek into some of the things that were generated by uh, SQL Map and uh, JFuzz Bro. Obviously, you can see, right, trying to run XP command shell, trying to create different users on the system. So this is just a way for us to say, oh, okay, the data loaded correctly. So this is using SQL parse, and what SQL parse does is it kind of gives us a generic representation of the SQL string, right? So we can take something that's kind of the escape sequence, and then you've got exec, you know, XP command shell followed by a ping command, and it breaks it up into these various data types that it, it believes it is. Is it 100% accurate? No, is it, you know, def is it good enough? Most definitely, is it really good? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually kind of nice. 
So we get these different tokens that represent kind of the generic form of the, the strings that we have in, in our SQL injection statements. And, and this becomes really important later on because it, you, do, you don't want to be doing a regex match on particular tokens and particular strings and oh did they, you know, did they do this delimiter or this identifier. I mean you kind of want to take it, you know, do, you want to do a data transformation to kind of this more conceptual space around okay what are the, what are the kinds of things that this SQL statement is trying to accomplish. Um, and SQL parse does a good job of that. So this is just a set up for later on in the notebook. Um, one thing to note, when we talk about n-grams, in this case, we're not talking about substrings. We're actually talking about, we use the term feature vector to describe the, the parsed SQL, and it's a, a vector of these, these different tokens. When we talk about n-grams, we're saying the number of tokens in that vector. So an n-gram of three, for example, on this first one, would be single identifier and float. That would be one possible n-gram of length three. And, and for those who don't, aren't familiar with n-grams, n-grams are typically done on strings. And so you can imagine, you know, I have a big sentence and I'm kind of breaking things up into, into tuples. You know, either, oh, I'm looking at every three characters and kind of sliding a window long, right? And that's called a three n-gram. Um, and and n-grams actually give you a sense of kind of, of more semantics. And in this case, for SQL statements, they're kind of saying, you know, oh, not only am I looking at individual tokens, but I'm looking at sets of tokens, and, and that kind of becomes, you know, a, again, a kind of a higher level thing where what are these sets of tokens trying to accomplish from, a, from an SQL perspective? No, precisely. Yeah. Uh, so, this is kind of where we begin to get into more of the the statistical side of things. As you can see on the top, we're running this thing called the g-test. What the g-test basically does is it tells us the probability of something that's likely to occur or in this case maybe not likely to occur in something else. It's a, it's a, so g-test is related to kind of a chi-squared test or Fisher's exact test. It's basically a, a independence uh, measure. And what you can do is you can say, well, if I, if I have a set of malicious SQL statements and a set of legit SQL statements, um, G-test will basically look at all of the tokens, and in this case, n-grams. And, and you'll notice one of the things we did is we just kind of, we kind of just blasted the n-grams and then just threw at them all at the statistics. We didn't, we didn't say, oh, we want one grams or two grams or three grams. We just computed them all and then let the statistics decide, hey, for, for this training set, I'm going to tell you what are the most meaningful differentiators. Um, and in some case, it was just a one token. In some case, it was a set of two tokens. And, and in other cases, it was three tokens. Um, I don't know if we have a picture of that. So yeah, it's slightly cut off, unfortunately. Am I um, control minus or something? Or command minus? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a good point. Maybe. There we go. So, so, so G-Test just go. said, okay, great. You know, give, given the set of tokens and, and sequences, here, here were the most meaningful differentiators between malicious and legit. So, for example, and we can run through a bunch of these um, slightly below, we would expect to see the, just the, the identifier, right, the n-gram of length one single significantly more times in a malicious statement than we would in a legitimate statement. So I don't know, we'd expect it to see, what is it, 99, basically 99 percent of malicious and less than 1 percent of, of legitimate. So this is kind of a much better way to view that type of data, right? We can begin to say, oh, all right, here are the breakouts. So the same exact n-grams that we listed in the table, but instead of actually looking at the numbers, let's look at how they lay out visually. So from here, we know going from left to right, in the red, we have the most common ones to be found in the malicia set. So we expect an n-gram of single to be found, and then another n-gram of single identifier to be found, right? And again, once again, these are all kind of those tokenized SQL statements in a slightly more generic form. 
then what the green represents, though, is the ones that are statistically not expected to be there. So kind of at a first pass, we could say, hey, maybe this is a signature, right? If we see a token of sing single in a string, then maybe that string is some amount significantly more likely to be SQL injection, whereas if it contains you know, the, the n-gram of keyword identifier, it's significantly less. So once again, this is just kind of um, going through and putting the sequences in the data frame. And then from here, this is where we begin to look at things. So we've got the, the string keyword, keyword DML, this n-gram, and we're saying just show us what's in them. And I don't know if it's a little bit easier if I... Actually, actually the, this one right there is interesting, right? So, so it, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so, so this data frame is, is interesting because this oh. is coming out of the statistics. This, the stats is basically saying this sequence is, is the one that's most identified with malicious uh, SQL statements. And here, here, kind of in the very first row that says raw SQL, you can see examples of the SQL statements that the statistics are identifying as yes, you know, these are highly correlated with malicious features. Um, and if you look at the statements, you can kind of see, yes, you know, those, those you know, kind of intuitively, those look like SQL inje they, injections. That's a good point. They generally look bad. So we can run through a couple more. Right, these ones generally look good. However, there's a, a large, large set of these that have this keyword, keyword DML pattern. And there's also a lot of malicious ones. So kind of delving into the data a little bit, we noticed that one of the tools was tacking on a bunch of nulls to try and figure out column width. So it kind of skewed that part. And this is likely where, right, some signature matching might fall flat on its face. Right, so once again, here's another one, this keyword identifier, as we saw, let me scroll up. This is where IPython gets interesting. I can't really, it's this row right here down at the bottom. So it's one of the less or least likely ones to appear in an actual SQL injection statement. But clearly when we ask the data and we say, hey, what, what has this tag? It goes, oh, there's actually a bunch of these in the malicious ones. So, Again, maybe, maybe not the best way to just rely on pure statistical analysis, show us what's least likely and what's most likely and let us build signatures or regular expressions over that. So what else can we do? Yeah. You have to talk about it. But <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> I, he, he had a note in the notebook, he's like, we need to find a hilarious picture. So I simply search Google Images for hilarious, and this was one of the very first results. <laughs> I, it doesn't have anything to do with SQL injection, but I, I love it, and despite Brian's protests, I said it's the NN. It's awesome. <laughs> so from here, we, we, we decided to play buzzword bingo a little bit more, and we took kind of the easy way out, and we said, let's cal calculate length and entropy, because who doesn't love length and entropy? As it turns out, you know, we kind of we kind of looked at those, and they were they were all over the map. So while not entirely interesting, I'll, I'll let Brian talk about that in a little bit more. So this is one of the ones that I, I really really want Brian to talk about. You can even see I got, we got a little note in the notebook to talk about the wizardry. So one of the reasons this is entirely important is there's a lot of different ways to go from, all right, I've got my data, and now I've got structured data, and now I have a basic feeling for the data, but now I want to do something with it. And this is kind of part of the notebook that really takes it from, from one domain to the other, so I'll, you should just dig in, dude. All right, so, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we talked about the pandas data frames and about how, you know, putting your data into these data frames really gets you one good step towards kind of all of these analytic options. Um, and so, you know, Mike talked about, oh, we just, you know, just for fun, we kind of computed length and entropy. And you can see, see in this data frame that we've taken, you know, length, we've taken entropy, we've taken 
the statistics on on the G-scores around whether you're matching malicious engrams. We've taken the statistics on the G-scores around whether you're matching legit engrams. And we've just kind of tacked those on as columns into our data frame. And, and even though it seems, I don't know, kind of provincial, these four columns then, you know, kind of set the stage for, uh, for, for kind of these deeper analytics um, both, both statistics and, and in this case, uh, you know, kind of we're going to use a uh, random forest machine learning algorithm. Um, so the, 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 the thing, the thing to take away here is that, you know, we, we did it, we did kind of a transformation that isn't always intuitive, right? So we went from what's called sparse data. So I have a set of tokens, right? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, at just, SQL engrams and those all become tokens uh, and through the statistics and through looking at you know oh if I'm a if I'm an SQL statement you know how many of these malicious engrams do I have and how many of these legit engrams do I have um, <clears throat> that got transformed into you know kind of this numeric kind of continuous uh, data and that's a lot more well suited towards towards a broader range of, of statistical algorithms and, and machine learning. So, I was just gonna say, so what the, the number in the malicious G or the legit underscore G column mean, so we computed all the G test scores for all the different n-grams, added them all together, and took the average. So that's kind of the statistical number of, hey, this is about how important these n-grams are that appear in this SQL statement. So it's the way to take that sparse data and, and move it into something more dense that's more suited towards actual analysis, well, different kinds of analysis, the kind that we wanted to do. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of detail here, and that's why we're providing the notebooks and the GitHub, so people can, can always go to the, to the website and kind of dive in. One of the things to do whenever you have, uh, you know, kind of these variables is get a, get a good sense and actually look at the variables. Look at their distributions. So, so box plot is a nice way to look at distributions. So here, you know, a box plot just shows quartiles. So, you know, the red bar is, is the mean, you know, the, the thing underneath it is the, is the uh, second quartile, and this little, this little whisker here is the first quartile. So it gives you a sense for the distribution of the data uh, over, over some range. Um, and, and as Mike mentioned, you know, we kind of threw in some, some variables just to kind of see, you know, are, are these, um, you know, do these variables help differentiate between, between, you know, malicious SQL uh, statements and legit ones? Um, and, you know, the length, really nothing there. Uh, oddly enough, for entropy, you know, malicious has a, a skewed entropy uh, uh, distribution that's lower than legit. And I think it's because they do a lot of repeated tokens, right? And so, so you know, with other use cases, you're like, ooh, high entropy bad, right? In this case, you know, low entropy bad, um, because, because they're just putting in padding and, and they're trying to, uh, t you know, do frame testing or whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> and, then, and then here, we're just kind of looking at some, some nice plots. And, and again, one of the things to take away here is, you know, yeah, it's, it's, you know, eight or nine lines of Python, but, you know, in eight or nine lines, I'm, I'm making this really nice plot. I'm, I'm embedding it into my, into my Python script. Um, and, and we're just looking at whether these uh, new variables that we've created, uh, you know, can, can help differentiate between one type of SQL statement and another. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, we looked, at, we looked at kind of all these different variables. So this right here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit Command Plus a couple times just so that we can zoom in. This right here I, I feel particularly passionate about because this is kind of the Rosetta Stone between Python world, you know, kind of arrays, and then matrix world where you're, you, you can employ kind of all of these really nice algorithms from things like scikit-learn. So, with a data frame, you can literally just take, pick your columns and say as matrix, and this becomes an X matrix. 
And so, you know, an, a, a matrix is just a, just a formalized way of capturing, you know, a large set of rows and columns. Um, but, it, you know, it has to be in the, in the exact right form. Um, and so when, you, when you're dealing with uh, things like scikit-learn, this is the kind of terminology they use. They'll use X, X matrix with a capital X for their feature matrix, and they'll use Y vector with a small Y for the, your labels. So if I have labels, that just becomes an array, and I make, uh, and I make a Y vector for that. And once you create this X matrix and Y vector, you are now locked and loaded. You can literally avail yourself of dozens of really deep uh, analytic, uh, you know, methods in, in these kind of deeper toolkits. And you can see, you know, we pulled in scikit-learn, we pulled in a random forest classifier, which is currently kind of like, hey, you know, if it's extremely uh, robust for, for different kinds of, of data and distributions, and it just it seems to work fairly well. It doesn't overfit. So overfitting is a big issue uh, depending on the, on the machine learning algorithm you're using. So random forest does a really good job of the way uh, it, it builds, you know, its forest of trees uh, tends to be robust around uh, avoiding overfitting. And so a couple of lines here and we're done. So we actually did a cross, this is called tenfold cross validation. And this is kind of the, the standard way of testing the performance, the predictive performance of your machine learning algorithm. Um, and you can see that we got 99% uh, accuracy. So, th so these are all numbers here that say, oh, you know, I'm going to randomly take uh, part of your data as training, and then I'm going to leave the rest of it as testing, and then I'm going to do that 10 times, and, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to give you the results for all of those tests. That's called tenfold uh, cross validation. What we chose is the feature vector. Let's scroll up just a second, right? We wanted to see what effect length, entropy, this token, <clears throat> excuse me, this token number, how many n-grams of the tokenized SQL string appeared in each to see how that combination of those four features could actually lead to a useful output, right? So there are many other things that we, we could have computed as well. This is what we chose. Is it 100% correct? Probably not, uh, but hopefully, right, it, it stimulates some other ideas, both for, for us and everybody else. And it, it's a good point. So, so the other thing is, you know, the notebook kind of leads you through. You know, here's how I loaded in the data from a bro log. You know, here's how I put it into a data frame. Here's how I, here's how I took my data frame and converted it to an X matrix. And so you could take the same concepts and, and you know, kind of apply it to your own data. So one of the things we, things we wanted to do is, you know, this 99% number, I don't know, that feels slightly dissatisfying, right? So you really want to get us a, a much more visceral, concrete sense around, okay, so when I did the classification, you know, how many legit things got classified as malicious? How many malicious things got classified as legit? So those, are, that, those terms are called false positive, false negative, um, and the best way to look at that is not with an accuracy number. The best way to look at it is with a confusion matrix. So confusion matrix sounds complex, but it's really just looking at these four quadrants. So here, and, and your confusion matrix, you always want it to have this, you know, kind of high diagonal. So here it's saying, you know, that 98.9% .9 of the legit stuff got classified as legit. 99.69% um, of the and then these off diagonals are, are showing you, okay, what is, you know, this is my false positive, so what is the legit stuff that got classified as malicious? And then my false negative is, what is the malicious stuff that got classified as legit? So even though 1% even though and, you know, 99% accuracy, woo, that sounds awesome, uh, you know, the reality here is if you're processing millions of SQL statements, 1%, you know, that's, you suddenly you're looking at maybe 10,000 statements, right? And so, so even though 1% sounds good kind of on, 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 on the surface, um, it's definitely a place for improvement. And so one of the things you can do with uh, these classifiers, they have a prediction me a method. They'll just keep, give you kind of a zero or one. Um, they also have a prediction probability method 
that will give you a continuous score between zero and one. And that's really useful for, for minimizing your false positives. Because you can say, look, I'm, gonna, I'm happy for you to miss some as long as you're not being noisy and, you, and you're not, you know, uh, uh, sending all these false positives. And so you can kind of tune that, that, uh, that probability prediction. Um, okay, so uh, it's probably we're running a little long. One of the things that's nice here is you're going you're gonna to ask the machine learning algorithm, hey, you know, in the features that I gave you, what, are, what did you think were the most important in differentiating? And you can see that length and entropy, it, they were kind of close to zero. It, did, it didn't actually think that those, those features were that important. Okay, so, uh, so here we're, we're looking at, we can kind of look at a couple of the misclassifications. Um, <clears throat> and, and at the bottom of the work is you have a training script that you run on, you know, a jillion samples, and then you make a model, and then you pickle it. So you just take the, you, and this is all in the notebook, you just take the, the, the scikit-learn model, you pickle it, pickle it, and then in an evaluation script, you unpickle it, and then you evaluate new samples that are streaming in. It actually shows you exactly how to do that. And so, in fact, we, you know, this is a little baby version of the entire notebook. So this is what your evaluation script looks like. It's literally this small. You just, the, the SQL statement comes in, you send it to the parser, you send it to the ingram extraction, um, you do these aggregations for the, for the G and L, you call predict, and this is that CLF there is the classifier. So you just call predict, and then it spits it out. And, and in fact, we did a little, you know, we just made some, some little joke SQL statements here to see whether the algorithm predicted whether it was le legit or malicious. And uh, my buddy Dorsey here, we, we always make fun of his mom, so I promised that we would put a, put a reference into his mom. Okay, so, uh, so, so sorry, kind of rambled on there. But, you know, we, we, you know, there's lots of cool work here on, on uh, SQL injection, so we included that material. Great question. Let me repeat it. The question was um, that we had 13,000 malicious samples and we only had 1,000 legitimate samples. You know, does that bias our results and would we get better results if we had more legit samples? So that, that was the question? Um, yes. Good observation. Uh, in general, for, for machine learning and, and these kind of statistics, the more the better. And so, you know, we, we you know, we, we gathered what we could given the, the time constraints, um, and it's actually harder in some cases to gather legit stuff than it is malicious stuff. Um, so, so definitely, you know, if gathering more legit samples would help uh, would help the performance of the algorithm. Good question. And that was just a quick deviation. That was kind of one of the reasons why we wanted to release these things for you guys to play with. I mean, if you're sitting on a wealth of really interesting data, right? Maybe you know, you go home, you run it, and you say, hey, look. I found these new and better results because those guys on stage weren't 100% correct, and, and here's how we can improve what they did. Yeah, and it's GitHub, so you can so you can always compare it back. Agree. They oh, so the, I guess the question is, did we look at adjacent statements if someone's doing blind SQL injection to see if there were any? correlation or relationship between multiple statements? The answer is no, we didn't, but I agree that probably would be super interesting to take a look at. Good observation. Uh, good, good, good observation. So sample bias is always an issue. So, so you know, when you're doing when you're doing statistics and machine learning, you know, one of the things to always watch out for is sample bias. You know, 
am I, is my sample somehow skewed in a way that's actually making my results look better or worse than they should? And, and I think the observation you're making is in this case, it probably makes our results look better than they should because we kind of had this mix and match of, of statements. Um, the, so the answer is that's an issue. Sample bias is always an issue. Uh, we haven't formally addressed it in this case. Uh, the, the one thing I'll, I'll throw out is things like, like it, the, the machine learning totally tossed those out anyway. It basically said from a feature importance perspective, they weren't important. So it's mostly looking at the statistics around uh, the G-test independence scores. Um, but, but it's a good observation. Uh, and, and probably to be, you know, it probably makes our, our uh, results a little better than, than maybe they should be. Do you want to jump to the next notebook? Yep. And then we'll, okay, cool. So we've got the second use case, and then we'll circle back around for questions on both, if that's okay. And since apparently we have no hard time limit as we were informed about either earlier, we're happy to stick around and answer questions and Okay, that's good enough. So I think we can do that. Okay. Oh. Okay. So with browser fingerprinting, once again, hey, given a HTTP request, how can I determine if it belonged to a legitimate browser or a piece of malware? That's kind of what we're going to set out to answer with this. One of the first things that we did was we sat on a network and we collected a whole bunch of HTTP requests. We used Bro for that. In the same GitHub repository, you can download the Bro script that'll actually print out all the, uh, the header values, the headers and their values. So once again, you can generate your own data, you can go grab the code and you'll be able to run this entire thing at home. You don't need, as a side note, you don't need super powerful computers to do this in most instances, we actually did all the research and computation on our laptops, so it really isn't awful. Um, the other thing that we did at the end, I'd like to say thanks to Contagio for having a really sweet malware dump. They have all the great PCAPs, so we were able to kind of grab some malicious PCAPs and see if any of those applied to, to what we were able to learn. So we'll kind of go a little bit faster on this one just so we can get through and answer more questions. Once again, reading the data from this one, we actually had 100,000 lines of prolog that we were going to digest. Now granted, that was both client and server, so we pruned those down to client only. And that's really all this does, is it just sets up the client event. In the bro script itself, it prints out the headers and their values as key value pairs in a JSON section. So we simply convert that JSON section once again to our favorite word, feature vector, and put it in a pandas data frame. This one I really have to point out, I groaned at it. So. <laughs> Best picture ever. <laughs> Come on, short agent. It's Come great. On, that's so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, one of the things we, we tried with this idea of a short agent is everybody has seen user agent strings and they're loud and they're gnarly and there's just a lot of crap in them. So we tried to figure out if there was a way we could kind of condense the model by saying, well, these are common features in a user agent string that we should pay attention to. Once again, we started off with a couple guesses. Some work better than others. We stuck with the ones that worked better. Is there room for improvement? Always. So what we did though, as you can see here, we took this user agent the super long multi-line thing and just simply compressed it down into features that we thought were important, right? This works against multiple browsers, so it doesn't have to be just Internet Explorer. It can be Firefox or Chrome or Opera. And you'll see a couple of these actually peppered through the data set. And all this function does is just simply computes the short, the short agent. We also threw out a couple different things that we don't necessarily want. So all the .NET stuff, we didn't feel like we needed the full version, we just kept uh, major and minor. So once again, taking a peek at the data, uh, I'll make this a little bit easier, hopefully. So this is kind of a, a mapping of the short agent to the types of header permutations that we see. So you can see for WebDAV, right, it's got so there's a whole lot of overlap, right? They generally all start with the same thing and they kind of have this same order-ish except for that you can kind of set these don't cares for particular headers like refer or cookie because they may or may not exist. 
Um, but this is, so we've got Microsoft Office, we've got a bunch of different kinds of Internet Explorer, and it's all terribly exciting. So once again, we kind of wanted to see this kind of other grouping of, of short agents, kind of what are we dealing with. So we have this other, and we have Internet Explorer, and we just kind of wanted to get a rough feel for actually what was in our, our data set. And you can kind of see in some of the short agents, right, we still keep things like toolbars right there, and there's another one up here, because they could possibly change browser behavior, right, as a browser helper object. And I think the numbers in the last column are all of the permutations associated with that agent. So it's all of the, I mean, what part of what we're mapping here is that Internet Explorer in particular had this huge number of permutations associated with its requests, right? It was kind of all over the map. That's a good point, yeah. Okay. And there's actually, this is, this is my favorite plot, you wanna? Oh yeah, so this, this plot again is another box plot. It's just showing the distribution of the number of permutations here grouped by, in this case, whether the agent was, was an Internet Explorer agent or, or some other agent. And you can see that, that, that other agents kind of have this fairly well-defined, okay, I, you know, I have a couple of different permutations of how I'm making requests, but, but IE is all over the map. And that's part of the challenge we have, right? I mean, if you have an agent that's all over the map, then, then how do you possibly make you know a signature for that for that agent? So here we just kind of and we said for a given permutation, what short agents does it map to? And you can already see right in the top of this table, the second entry entropy or the second entry has this one header permutation, this accept accept encoding user agent host connection cookie, maps to six different short agents. Right, so you, you can see in the data there's kind of this really weird overlap of stuff. And furthermore, you know, <clears throat> Internet Explorer doesn't necessarily make this any easier with its compatibility modes and all that other kind of really awesome things it does to, to make uh, users' lives easier. So this was one of our bigger challenges was, okay, we've got, you know, this many-to-one and this one-to-many mapping. How do we deal with it? How can we make something useful come out of this? So that way, you know, maybe we can find malware easily by saying, well, show me everything that I can't, or most things that I can't identify on, on my network. We got 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so this is, one of the things that we looked at too was, was doing a, a Levenstein distance. Um, and I like, I really like Brian's implementation of this, so I'm gonna let him go on about like why Levenstein is cool, but why our kind of modified Levenstein is slightly more interesting, maybe? Uh, okay, so... Um, yes, I have to be quick. <laughs> so, I, I put this in here because, you know, it, it seems like extremely challenging uh, ground that we're on here. So, so, given all of these different permutations and all these different agents, you know, how do we, how do, we do something meaningful? Um, and, you know, we, 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 we kind of pulled out quite a few different things here. Um, but, but one of the things we thought would be interesting is, okay, well, can I, can I group the permutations in a meaningful way, right? I mean, can I, can I, can I say, well, that, you know, yes, I have, you know, for, for, for Internet Explorer 7, I have 67 different permutations, but, but, you know, are 32 of them kind of the same, and then, and then maybe the Internet Explorer goes into kind of a different mode, and then, and then 16 of those are kind of the same. I mean, you know, we wanted to, get, to bring some organization to how we looked at, at, at these things and how we might develop signatures for them, right? Because, you know, with 67 permutations, you know, one regex is just going to be, you know, Either, either amazingly overfit or amazingly general, and, and just not work in any meaningful way. So um, I, I think I think I'm going to you know some of this I'm going to leave just for for kind of exploration offline if people are interested. But Levenstein distance is, is an interesting way to think about it. So typically, uh, Levenstein is is you're looking at at strings and you're looking at characters within strings, and it's often called edit distance. So oh you know how many how, you know 
and Levinstein measures three things, uh, additions, deletions, and then substitutions. So, so those are the three measures that it has. And so um, here, instead of using characters and strings, we're actually just using token, tokens and sequences. So um, you can see, I, so, um, so here is an example that hopefully you can see. So we have, you know, these four kind of kind of mocked up uh, uh, header requests, and and the Levinstein distance is associated with them. Um, I, you know, I think it's important for people to understand what's happening here. So the the distance between A and B is one because we deleted one token. Um, the distance between B and C is one because we substituted one token. And then, and then the distance between A and D is two. And can someone tell me, as a user audience experience, why that is? Different order, right. And so, so, so cookie here got, got transferred to the beginning, but, but then accept and user agent and host all remain the same. And you can imagine the kind of bookkeeping associated with that, right? I mean, that last example really gives you a sense for, um, and they do this really cool bookkeeping kind of inside this, this two-dimensional matrix, and then you do this back pathing to, to actually look at the, at the edit operations. Um, and so I wanted to give you a sense for that, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. And, and now, uh, you know, if you go to the data hacking repo, we just, there's just a library and you say, hey, give me the Levinstein, Levinstein distance of these things, and it pops it out. Um, so, without much time left, we'll, what, the way we're using this is as a similarity metric. So we're actually kind of taking all of the, all of the agent strings, we're computing these similarities. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Here's, here's an example, you know, for this agent here, right, here, here are the most similar header strings, and it kind of groups them up into pairings. And then, um, you know, the thing that, that will just have to be, you know, part of, part of the fun uh, exploration you do if you're interested offline is now that you have those similarity pairings, um, you can actually take those similarity pairings and make a hierarchical cluster. So I can, I can from the bottom up, I can take the, the things that are most similar and kind of weave those together and kind of this, into this hierarchical cluster. Um, and, you know, it sounds complicated and, and there's quite a bit of bookkeeping to it, but, uh, you know, if you have a nice Python module that does it for you, um, that's what we do here. And so here's an example of that. Um, and so this is, um, this is one of the Safari agents. Um, and we have this kind of cool viz here. So you can, all of these uh, header requests kind of are, are of the form host connection blah, and then at the bottom here kind of has this weird one, you know, it starts with accept refer, right? But you can see that higher clustering just automatically pulled that out for you, right? And it's, it's fairly detailed, right? I mean, it's not like a hard clustering like k-means or something. You know, if I, if I k-means, you know, two or something, you know, what would that mean? But this, this all just came out uh, as part of the natural uh, organic way that heart clustering works, and and you know here's a, here's you know one of the one of the IE agents, um, and you know it's a lot more complicated, but you know it's cool, and 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 in fact what we're going to do is we're going to build regular expressions for each of these subtrees, because each subtree contains sequences that are that are that are kind of the most similar to each other uh, out of all the sequences, um, and. So that, that's what we did at the end of the day, is we uh, took the hierarchical tree, built regular expressions, um, and, uh, and, the, and then, so what it means is, instead of building one regular expression that tries to capture all of the possible permutations of, of all of the header strings for that agent, we built a set of permutations kind of, kind of formally informed by the hierarchical tree itself. So the hierarchical tree said you should build one regex here, another here, because there's enough difference between these things so that it makes sense to have a set of regular expressions. So, so here we have a, a validation at the end, and so we, of course, you know, part of the thing you do with the validation is you say, okay, well, I don't want it to alert on my training set, obviously. So, you know, so I ran it to the training set, 45,000 requests, no alerts. Um, 
ran it through uh, the Contagio, uh, you know, crime PCAP set. Um, you know, they, they had agents that we didn't, and so we're just matching on, you know, we're just taking the agents that, that, we, that matched up and we're, tr and we're testing our regular expressions against those agents, and there were, there were 21 requests with, with the agents in our training set, and it hit on all 21 requests. So, you know, this is, this is definitely, uh, you know, we kind, of, we kind of qualify this. This is definitely a work in progress. You know, I wouldn't take the results too seriously here. It's kind of a, kind of a smaller training set, you know, smaller uh, test set. But, you know, it's kind of some interesting material. Like, oh, it's a way of thinking about how you organize your data, right? Like, you know, you know oh, I, I compute similarities, and then I compute hierarchical trees, and then that, that really organizes my data in a way that, that, I, that maybe I haven't thought about before. Or, or, and, 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 and hierarchical trees are amazingly useful at capturing both kind of broad categorization and then, and then small similarities. So you know, on both levels, you might, from the top, you might want to say, well, how does this thing look? You know, are there five major groups you know, of my million rows, right? That's meaningful. And then and the other thing that's meaningful is, I have a, I have a particular row. Show me the things that are hi most highly similar to that row. And, and higher clustering gives you, gives you both of those levels. OK, so, uh, so we're out of time. Um, just for fun, I wanted to point out there was this really nice IPython notebook on, on generating uh, regular expressions. And it was kind of based off this XKCD comic. So if you just Google XKCD regexp, uh, the guy does this cool kind of genetically algorithm-based uh, regular expressions. So um, ours, ours aren't that fancy, but, uh, but you know, it's cool and it's in Python, so. Okay, so uh, I think time for questions. Uh, so, so a lot of this work is is mostly about um, you know exploring data analysis techniques and kind of like kind of broadening like the the things in your toolbox like oh things in my toolbox that I could use in these different ways. Um, in this case, it wasn't so much about hey we're, we're going to get to some some performance mesh, metric and we're going to you know beat some 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 commodity product. We, so we didn't. We didn't do any comparison there. Uh, the main point, digest the data so we can help or enable people to make more community contributions around two things that we are aware of and we like to use for detection so that way we can kind of enhance those signature bases, so to speak. But uh, I guess to repeat the question, did we look at or compare to anything from the BrowseCap project or uh, UAF parser? UAS parser. Oh, okay. No, I haven't played with that one. So yeah. So we did not compare with browser cap or UAS parser. Thanks. But those, but those are both good resources. And and maybe as a follow-on project, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, additional questions. It's a good idea. Um, it depends probably on, would it be hard to incorporate this work into a reverse proxy? It probably depends on what you're using for reverse proxy. Uh, something maybe like Blue Coat might be significantly harder where they're not as open, but something like Squid, I'll get in trouble for saying this, I don't imagine it would be terribly hard. And I'm sure those will come back to bite me in the ass. In the back. Where do we get the data for the SQL injection? So one of, one of our friends actually <laughs> ran JBROFuzz and SQL map and then extracted all of the data from those test runs. So that's where we got the malicious set. The le legitimate set, we literally searched Google for like file type SQL and then through select create a couple other SQL verbs and generic real world data sample. So is it perfect? No. Is it what we had to play with? Yes. We, we took the fact that they came from, so how did we get the classification labels? We labeled malicious as ones that we ran 
from tools designed to pen, chat, ten, pen test SQL injection. And then the ones that we found on the internet, they were generally associated with open source projects and whatnot. So we made the blanket assumption that they were going to be legitimate. Yeah, so I guess did we consider, maybe this is a, a, a summarization, did we consider the performance of the end tools that we help, help, hope to take the techniques and push them into as far as to guide our output so it's performant on those tools? Is that? No, no, no. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that was his point, too, around, around did we compare the browser fingerprinting to other solutions? Um, and, and, you know, those comparisons are, are, are somewhat, somewhat tedious. Um, and and they're and they're and they also tend you know you, you tend to have sample bias so so you know what you know what are the samples that you're comparing against you know is it the samples that time um, it, they're good observations and uh, you know at this point it, again it's mostly just about exposing the technique showing how the techniques get used in some nice kind of real world use cases um, you know whether whether at the end of the day uh, the techniques perform better from some from from some absolute sense than than commercial tools, you know, I have no idea. There there was some operational interest, so running things like Puff and Bro on what they had kind of out of the box, so to speak, we found some lack of signatures or lack of things that would help make these type of use cases useful. So from that is kind of where we, we deviated and said, hey, I wonder if there's a way we can help feed back into these kinds of things to make it more useful for us and everybody else. Uh, but operationalizing this kind of stuff tends to be anywhere from a small pain in the ass to a completely giant one. All right, good questions. Any, any more questions? Okay, we're, we're wrapping up. We're getting the wrap-up signal. All right. So thanks Thank for so sticking much. around for the last presentation. Do you want me to I'll just unplug? Yeah. I don't know. Computers.